Kai, I think um, if I, if my notes are correct, uh, you're the founder of Nessie Circuits. You will um, present uh, something about your custom hardware that you built and that you're selling. You did your PhD in uh, 2022 at TU Dresden, which we now have a different co contact mm -hmm. to, but very interesting. But you're now in the US, if I'm informed correctly, uh, so probably you're just starting your day. Um, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to the talk and uh, learning something about a modular battery free development platform. The stage is yours. Hi, sorry, I, I lost you for a second, um, but I think I'm back now. <laughs> Let's hope it works from now on. All right, um, thank you, thank you very much for, for the introduction. It's my pleasure um, to present Rioty today. You may be wondering about the name, so I'll clear this up right now. Rioty stands for the Responsible Internet of Things, and any resemblance to Riot OS is purely coincidental. Nonetheless, I think Rioty makes for a very interesting target for Riot OS, and I hope this talk will spark a discussion of possible synergies. You've probably all seen one of these high-tech surveillance drones that the government is using to spy on the population. They come with a camera, a microphone, a microcontroller, and a wireless transmitter. To power these components, the drones carry a battery. Clearly, this battery cannot be too large or too heavy, because otherwise the drone wouldn't be able to fly. But the currently installed battery only lasts for a short time before it has to be replaced. Many people on the internet claim that the purpose of the lockdowns and curfews in 2020 was to covertly replace the batteries of these drones. Of course, this is just a wild conspiracy theory, but the problem with the batteries is very real. Cyber-physical systems that embed sensing, computing, storage, and control in the physical world have become ubiquitous, with applications ranging from factory automation to implantable biologgers. Billions of these devices are mobile or deployed in remote areas where wires cannot be used. Instead, devices must rely on local energy sources like batteries. But batteries have limited capacity, and after running out, the device stops working. Depending on the battery capacity and the power consumption of the device, this may happen after a few weeks or months already. Many applications, on the other hand, require much longer lifetimes. And this would require frequent replacement of empty batteries, which is problematic due to three reasons. First, it is extremely expensive. For example, replacing the batteries of just a single industrial IoT sensor can cost up to $500, much more than the cost for the actual hardware. So this doesn't scale to deployments with thousands of devices. Second, one-way batteries are very unsustainable. In the US alone, the waste from batteries sums up to 180,000 tons per year, according to the Environmental Protection Agency. And only a fraction of this hazardous waste is recycled, while the majority is either burned or ends up in landfill. Finally, there are many applications where replacing batteries is not possible at all, like GPS tracking of migratory birds. To operate autonomously and to reduce the environmental impact of disposable batteries, devices can instead use rechargeable batteries and replenish them by harvesting renewable energy from the environment. Common sources are solar cells or thermoelectric harvesters that generate electrical energy from thermal gradients. With this approach, devices can operate for years without battery replacement, which is a significant improvement over traditional battery-powered devices. But rechargeable batteries have other significant drawbacks. Extracting the lithium that is used in most of today's rechargeable batteries poses a heavy burden on the environment. The cathodes often contain cobalt, which is mined under catastrophic humanitarian conditions. Finally, rechargeable batteries are subject to aging and highly susceptible to thermal stress. When worn out, lithium batteries can bloat, catch fire, and release toxic chemicals into the environment. Motivated by these shortcomings, researchers started wondering if it's possible to omit the battery altogether and instead use small capacitors as energy buffers. These capacitors have significant advantages over rechargeable batteries. For example, they maintain around 85% of their original capacitance after 20 years, while a lithium battery reaches its end of life after just a few years of typical usage. 
The main ingredient of state-of-the-art ceramic capacitors is barite, a mineral that is easy to extract and commonly found around the globe. Lithium batteries, on the other hand, contain a number of problematic materials. Finally, ceramic capacitors have very low leakage current in the order of a few nanoamperes, while lithium batteries have a self-discharge current of tens of microamperes. In summary, going battery-free allows building tiny, cheap, and sustainable devices that can be operated maintenance-free for decades. For example, here you see a prototype battery-free device. It can efficiently harvest energy from a variety of sources and uses a tiny 22 microfarad ceramic capacitor as energy storage. It comes with all necessary components to read and process sensor values and to send the results over a wireless network. So too easy, right? We just replace the battery with the capacitor, run our application and protocol software, and we're done. Well, no. Because of low energy availability and low storage capacity, battery-free be devices behave very differently from traditional battery-powered devices. For example, due to the unreliable power supply, it is difficult for applications to actually make any forward progress, as they keep losing application state that is stored in non-volatile memory. Similarly, clocks rely on a steady power supply for keeping track of time. And finally, without timekeeping and without knowing when a device is on or off, communication becomes extremely difficult. So let's assume we have a good idea for a new algorithm that enables forward progress on battery-free devices. We may draft some code, perhaps run it on a simulator to get some initial results. The results look very promising, so we tell our coworkers about it. But they are not quite convinced. Would this run on real hardware out in the field? Well, no problem. We just hop on Mouser, order a development board, implement our algorithm, and demonstrate that it actually works in practice. But whoopsie, if we look for it on Mouser, there are no development boards available for battery-free devices. So how can we test our new algorithm? Well, we're not the first ones with a good idea. So maybe we can reuse a hardware design from other researchers. And indeed, there are quite a few battery-free platforms proposed in literature, and most of them are even open source. But on a closer look, we find that they are mostly quick shot designs for one specific application. Furthermore, many components aren't available anymore, and the platforms are mostly undocumented. So now we have two choices. Either we deal with ill-documented schematics and missing components, or we design our own platform from scratch. Both ways require skilled engineers, weeks of working time, and significant equipment and budget for prototyping. This energy could be used to actually work on our project. So while we're used to having Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and hundreds of more specialized platforms available to test our ideas on battery-powered devices, there is a lack of comparable platforms for battery-free devices. To change that, we develop Rioty. Rioty is the first general purpose development platform for battery free devices that is both open source and commercially available. It consists of hardware, software, and documentation and makes it easy for beginners to get started with battery free technology while also catering to the needs of various subfields in the battery free research domain. Let's have a look at the hardware first. The Rioty board is a user-friendly development board integrating key components of a battery-free device with an onboard programmer, a push button, LEDs, a USB-C port, and expansion headers. I bought, brought one of these boards with me today so you can have a closer look at it. The board's headers expose signals for supply voltage, capacitor voltage, and 11 GPIO pins supporting I2C, SPI, and analog sensor applications. This allows connecting expansion, header, expansion shields like our solar shield that has four small solar panels and a two position sliding switch that connects none, one, three, or all four panels in parallel. The capacitor shield has eight capacitors of different values and dielectrics and an eight position sliding switch to select different combinations of capacitors. And finally, the sensor shield adds a microphone, an accelerometer, and a temperature and humidity sensor. With this combination of boards, it's very easy to quickly build a fully functional battery-free device without soldering or ugly breadboard connections. But we also wanted to make sure that users can seamlessly move from a prototype to a deployment-ready device that meets the requirements of real applications in terms of size and weight. 
To this end, we integrated the core components of Riot in a tiny module, similar to the ubiquitous ESP32 modules. The module hosts a boost charger to transfer energy from a harvester like a solar cell to an internal capacitor, a buck regulator to provide a regulated supply voltage, a voltage supervisor, and two microcontrollers. We'll talk about this um, in greater detail later. This module can be reflowed soldered onto a user's PCB. Adding a small solar panel is enough to build a fully functional tiny battery-free device, which can then be programmed with our Riot Pro. I guess I don't need to, need to tell this to a community of operating system developers. When developing an application or working on a new technology, you don't want to start from scratch on bare metal hardware. You don't want to write a UR driver when developing a network protocol, and you don't want to develop a network protocol just to send some debugging data when developing a timekeeping solution. Instead, you want to focus on your problem while relying on existing software support for everything else. And that's why we put great effort into providing a comprehensive software development kit for Riot. It consists of three components a battery-free runtime environment that executes user code while handling all the nasty problems associated with battery-free devices, an extensive set of drivers and two network protocols, and 18 examples ranging from a UART Hello World to a more complex um, hot red detection application. The SDK is based on GCC and Makefiles, and we provide a template application project that shows how to develop applications with the SDK in Visual Studio Code. Installing the compiler and SDK may still provide a hurdle for programming novices. Therefore, we decided to make getting started with Reality even easier by providing a, an Arduino package that can be installed cross-platform with just a few mouse clicks. Now that you've gotten the bigger picture of what Reality is, let's dive a little deeper and walk through an actual battery-free application. Our application here is a solar-powered hotword detection. We have a battery-free device with solar panels somewhere in the room, and when hearing some predefined hot words, it's supposed to send a message to trigger some action. We assemble our device by stacking together a Riot U board, a sensor shield, a capacitor shield, and a solar shield. Next, we write the application code. The Riot SDK natively supports TensorFlow Lite, and we use the pre-trained hot word detection model from one of their examples. This makes the code relatively easy. First, we wait for the microphone to detect the sound. Then we sample the microphone for one second. We run inference using our model. And finally, we transmit the result. The energy that can be harvested from the solar panels is too low to support the current draw while the device is active. Therefore, we need to accumulate energy in the capacitor and then use um, that energy to run the application. Here you see how the capacitor slowly charges up and then waits for a sound. Upon detection of the sound, the sampling starts. But the energy required to sample the microphone for one second is far more than what we can store in the onboard capacitance. And as a result, the sampling fails. Instead, we need to provision our device now with enough storage capacity co to complete this atomic operation of sampling the microphone. Thankfully, this is pretty easy with Rarity. We just use the sliding switches on the capacitor shield to add capacitance until the sampling of the microphone completes. Great, so now the sampling completes and right after sampling, our inference starts. But this consumes even higher current and quickly discharges the capacitor. At some point, the capacitor voltage drops below the brownout voltage of the microcontroller. It powers off and all our samples that we have previously taken from the microphone are lost because they were stored in volatile SRAM. And this would happen again and again because our energy storage is just not big enough to complete the whole task from sampling to transmitting the result. How can we prevent this? One way would be to add even more capacitance, but that increases size, cost, and weight of the device, at some point defeating the, um, the, the point of going battery free. A much better way would be to split the task into multiple execution cycles, avoiding power failures and associated loss of progress. Here we see that after a few execution cycles, we would be done and can, could, send our result, um, yeah, could send our result to, to the receiver. But how do we do that? One way would be to just push that responsibility to the application developer. But they hardly know the exact power consumption and also the right points in time to suspend execution depends on the capacitor size and the energy input. 
So this would make programming very tedious and has a high risk of failure. Instead, Riot implements two mechanisms that automatically handle suspension and resumption of any application without burdening the developer. One is an ultra low power voltage supervisor that monitors the capacitor voltage and outputs two signals indicating whether the capacitor voltage is below, between, or above two thresholds. The other one is a software runtime that automatically suspends and resumes application uh, execution of arbitrary user code based on these two signals. In some applications, the required energy per execution cycles can change from cycle to cycle. Therefore, it is important to have configurable thresholds that allow changing the usable capacitor in software. Traditionally, this has been implemented with a digital potentiometer. But these potentiometers have values in the 100 kilo ohms range, and therefore they have a pretty high current consumption in the order of tens of microamperes. We came up with a custom resistor network inspired by traditional R2R DACs that generates nine different thresholds based on two GPIO inputs. The two three-state GPIOs can be put in low, high, or imp high impedance mode, allowing for a total of nine different input states. We analytically derived um, the, the output voltages for all nine input states and used brute, for op brute force optimization to select the combination of resistor values resulting in voltage thresholds that are closest to our defined target values. The resulting implementation with six O201 sized resistors is cheap, small and consumes a maximum of 830 nanoamperes. Great, so now the hardware can notify the system when the capacitor voltage gets low and also when it returns above the high threshold. But we still need a way to suspend and resume um, the execution in software. This is handled by our intermittent runtime. So we do have the user application running on the CPU and we're now looking for a way to suspend execution, save the application's context in memory we will see why this is necessary later, and resume at a later point in time. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's one of the core components of any multitasking operating system. So instead of reinventing the wheel, we used an existing impl uh, implementation. Shame on us, it's not Riot OS. Um, we decided to go with FreeRTOS, mainly because we know it pretty well and it's really just a kernel, which is exactly what we, what we wanted in this case. We implement the runtime as three free artless tasks. A user task with medium priority executes the application. When the capacitor voltage gets low, a high priority system task becomes active, prepares the system for sleep, and suspends the user task. It then yields to a low priority idle task that keeps the microcontroller in an ultra low power sleep mode. When the capacitor voltage reaches the resume threshold, an interrupt resumes the user task and execution continues. Now we know how, Riety can, how a Riety device can make forward progress despite the power input being lower than the current draw of the application. But what happens when power ceases completely for a while? For example, in case of a solar panel, someone might walk and cast a shadow on the panel. For many forms of energy harvesting, this is actually fairly common. Think of a kinetic energy harvesting device that is powered from human motion. As soon as the person wearing the device rests, energy ceases. And with, with what we've seen so far, the capacitor voltage will drain after a while, and even going into a low power sleep mode cannot prevent this. After falling below a certain value, power is cut and we lose all our progress. The only way to still make progress in this scenario is to retain application state across these power failures. For this purpose, Riot comes with two microcontrollers. The NRF52833, has a powerful Cortex-M4 CPU with floating point unit and the low power 2.4 gigahertz radio. The MSP430 has 128 kilobyte of ferroelectric RAM. In contrast to traditional flash, this non-volatile memory can be written just like SRAM, but it retains its content without a power supply. The two microcontrollers communicate with each other over SPI. In our default implementation, the user application and runtime execute on the NRF52. And when the capacitor voltage drops below the suspend threshold, the system task copies the user stack and the global and static variables over to the non-volatile memory on the MSP430. After a power failure, this snapshot is restored and execution continues with the next in instruction. After a few more cycles, inference completes and the result can be transmitted to the receiver. 
This whole hot red detection example is also part of the SDK. And if you have a set of riot boards, you can try it out yourself. Now we've dived in to show you some specific solutions to problems that arise on battery-free platforms. Riot users can rely on these solutions to implement algorithms, applications, or network protocols without having to deal with these problems. In that sense, Riot follows a batteries included approach. However, these are just basically suggestions, and Riot is designed to be general purpose and hackable. The Riot hardware has been designed with KiKit, and all schematics and layouts are available on GitHub. There's a documentation page with additional info, pinouts, API descriptions, and everything else in one place. While Riot supports various ways to run an application from capacitive storage only, you can easily add a rechargeable battery and use it like a traditional energy harvesting device. And with just one command, you can enable a powered mode that is very convenient for development and debugging. We've recently used this mode to slowly introduce students to general concepts on, of um, microcontrollers on the same platform that they then later use to learn about battery-free technology. So if you're up for the challenge to make Riot OS fit for the battery-free internet of things, you can now easily head over to Mouser, order the Riot hardware and get your hands dirty. And thanks to Christian's initial work on a port, you wouldn't even have to start from scratch. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now looking forward to discussing any, any and all questions. Thanks a lot, Kai. Um, any questions? Thanks. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, one is, uh, can you also power off the NRF? So you, you run the main application on the MSP430 and only turn on the NRF when needed to st st store, uh, con uh, conserve even more power? Yes, absolutely. So um, our implementation in the, that's basically um, yeah, part of the SDK is currently running mainly on the NRF, but the hardware totally supports that. You can just put the NRF in a very, very low power mode, basically power off mode, where it consumes just a few nano amperes, and you can um, run your application on the MSP430, and it has access to all the peripherals and GPIOs and so on. So that's that's definitely possible and actually a use case that we that we have like designed into the hardware. Yeah. And, and the other question, uh, Marian, recent, like maybe last year, uh, modernized the MSP430 port of Riot quite a bit. Uh, have you looked into that if it also helps with this uh, part, or are they different from the ones supported in Riot? Um, I haven't really looked into it. So to be honest, I was mainly focused on on getting that, um, like getting that runtime working on the on the NRF. Um, I haven't really done much work on the on the MSP 430. Um, so yeah, I can't really can't really tell you too much about this. Okay, test test. Okay. Um, I was wondering how security uh, has an impact in this in this scenario, specifically since you are also using some communication protocols. Did you do some measurements on that? Measurements in terms of um, of what? Well, the use of security in com with communication protocols uh, in your scenario. Security is often the security algorithms tend to be quite power hungry, and I'm curious whether this can only be used without security or so. Um, no, I mean there's you can execute any code, and you have access to to all the peripherals that that also provide some acceleration for for. Um, for cryptographic um, algorithms and so on, so there's not a big um, difference to to just like um, yeah just like working with a with a power device 
I know that there is some work um, going on for security and battery free because there's there are some additional attack vectors by, for example, modifying the energy input of a device. You may be able to um, to break some of the some of the um, security mechanisms that are currently implemented for for battery powered um, devices. But I haven't um, like personally personally worked in that direction. But this is exactly why we need this platform to to enable um, people who who work in um, on these topics to to just like implement solutions, test out um, test out different scenarios, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any further questions? Okay. Christian was first, I guess, or. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I noticed that the you have a lot of uh, open source hardware on your on the GitHub. Um, are there any plans to release the uh, KiCad of the module itself? Yes. In fact, it is already released. However, under a a pseudonym, um, but um, it is it is public already. Um, it's called Voltix. Um, but um, I will I will release probably within the next like two weeks. I will um, release a new repository that contains the full um, schematics and layout of the of the module. Yes, under the proper name Rioty. Um, one one question on the topic of radio communication. Um, have you tried this out with say, with a, one of the more power preserving Macs, say Open DSME or or Sixtish? Um, to have the device on active on the radio um, while there is just say regular workspace lighting well, when there are regular workspace lighting conditions is that something ca that can work or it, would that only work when there is like direct sun and the device can come onto the network just occasionally and pull yeah that's um, that's an interesting question so um Yes, if you have enough energy availability to basically freely turn on and off like you want, then you're basically in a battery powered regime, although you may not have a battery. And then you can run whatever protocol you want. I mean, this is an NRF52, there's like 100 network protocols that you can run. That's the easy case. If you're in a like battery free scenario in the sense that you cannot freely choose when to turn on and off, then none of these existing protocols work. Um, my PhD was exactly on this topic of how can you, how can two devices exchange um, data or even like um, agree on on point, common points in time to wake up um, in in a scenario where yeah energy availability fluctuates and is generally low. Um, there's like research in that direction is pretty pretty hot topic right now and um, things are things are like there's a lot of a um, lot of cool stuff popping up but you cannot in this scenario you can certainly not run something like like tish or even BLE or, or any of these of these protocols because they fundamentally rely on the assumption that you can control when the device is on and when it's off um, but so ju just to to kind of follow up on that um, if the peer is pow generally powered, and you are running in, in one of the beacon enabled modes, well, like say the, the device wakes up, sends a beacon and then communicates. How often can a communication event of say exchanging three or four packets happen in say conditions such as here? It's like ballpark, is that um, once per hour, once per day, once every five minutes? No, it will typically be a lot more frequent. I mean, yeah, it's it's totally dependent on your on the on your harvesting and the conditions and so on. But just like the assumptions that we've usually worked in when when developing our network protocols, it would be that the device turns on for say one or two milliseconds every one hundred milliseconds. So that would be a very typical um, typical pattern that you would observe. Um, when harvesting from solar indoors with a device of, of this size. So scenarios where you have one power peer, yes, that um, that can can work, um, but still you would need to 
like in many in many protocols, there's still the assumption that um, that even the client device, the like lower part client device, um, can control to like be on at a certain time in order to receive something from from the from the access point, right? And to assure this assumption, it's it's not easy with with battery free devices. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, then that's it. Uh, thanks the speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>